specifically Zura. Um, Zura Baman, Country Director of Search for Common Ground in Afghanistan, Azam Tomei, a Conflict Analyst on Lebanon and Syria at the Search Office in Lebanon, and Tommy McCarthy, Project Officer at Search in Sierra Leone. Um, before we start, just a couple of housekeeping points. Um, so this event will be a discussion among our guests. We will first hear some reflection from Search staff about the challenges they are seeing from engaging local communities in countries that have experienced or are experiencing um, conflict and peace processes. We will then invite our distinguished expert, Hiba, to help us think through what we can do differently uh, to make peace processes work. Um, we will then have time for Q&A, and we encourage all our listeners uh, to please type questions in our uh, chat box and also uh, any comments, any thoughts that we would like you would like to add to our discussion. This event is also being recorded and will be shared on our website after after um, afterwards. So um, why is this topic about uh, inclusive and sustainable peace processes so important today? Uh, so, um, according to a 2005 UN Secretary General report in larger, in larger Freedom, roughly half of all countries that emerge from war lapse back into violence within five years. According to more recent research led by Tanya Pfaffenholz, almost 50% of all negotiated settlements fail in the first five years of implementation. And this, of course, you know, we, we, there's evidence of the struggle uh, all around us. Certainly the delays in the Afghan peace talks, uh, an ongoing military coup in Myanmar, and increased violence between Israel and Palestine all highlight these di the difficulties of pursuing a successful peace process. For nearly 40 years, the Search for Common Ground has worked in some of the mo world's most challenging conflicts from Myanmar to Yemen to Syria. We have seen how many of these processes unfortunately have failed because of the inclusion only of leaders and elites. But Search has strived really to uh, foster the inclusion of women, youth, minorities, uh, traditional leaders, all those who experience really violence on a daily basis to ensure that their voice may be heard and that their meaningful contributions be uh, actually included in, in these processes. So Search's uh, latest uh, involvement in this work has been represented by our joining the Principles for Inclusive Peace Initiative in November 2020, and concurrently also uh, conducting some USIP-supported research uh, on senior mediators and what it means to uh, essentially lead a peace process, what, are, what makes these peace processes more inclusive and sustainable, and what are those cha the challenges that uh, uh, hold us up. Um, and so specifically on the Principles for Inclusive Peace Initiative, this is a global participatory initiative hosted by Interpeace to reframe the current narrow, exclusionary, and flawed way uh, that peace processes are understood and implemented. Um, the Principles for Inclusive Peace is a collective effort to develop a new set of principles to better enable local, national, and international actors to craft more inclusive approaches that result in long-term sustainable peace. And we'll hear all about this initiative from, uh, from our uh, speakers. Um, and uh, in regards to the USIP research, uh, Search has recently also interviewed 40 among senior mediators and, and uh, experts and uh, um, from, from academia and from, from the field to understand what makes peace processes more inclusive and sustainable. And some of the results that have been highlighted through this research are, of course, related to the involvement of local actors, um, since people locally will support solutions they help create. Um, they've also, this research has also highlighted the limiting tailoring of peace agreements and the absence of a plan to really put in place these provisions coming from these processes, both from a human and a financial standpoint. And then the limits to the practice of mediation, including limiting mandates, the use of more coercive type of tax tactics at the t negotiation table, and the lack of diversity among mediators and their teams. So we'll have an opportunity to expand on all of these points, I'm sure, throughout this, this conversation today. So um, 
we will both hear. So as I mentioned earlier, we will hear from our experts in Afghanistan, Syria and Sierra Leone about the finding of the research, the demands of un marginalized and underrepresented groups in peace processes, and also offer insights on how we can ensure that these peace processes be more inclusive and effective. We will then hear from Hiba, um, who will tell us more about this initiative and how it's seeking to advance inclusion and sustainability of peace processes and agreements. And before I open it up to our um, speakers from Search, I'd like to maybe, Hiba, if you would like to come in and just say, briefly introduce the Principles for Peace Initiative. Um, yeah, thank you. Great, thank you very much, uh, Claudia. And it's, it's a real pleasure to join this uh, important uh, exchange uh, on behalf of the Principles for Peace Initiative. Um, I'm very much looking forward to the insights uh, from the various country consultations that were conducted by the colleagues at Search for Common Grounds as part of their contribution and efforts to the Principles for Peace Initiative. Uh, so really looking forward uh, to, to that part of the discussion. Maybe a few words about the Principles for Peace Initiative. You've talked, Claudia, um, about some of the statistics about the poor track record of negotiated settlements and the research by Tania and other uh, colleagues in the space. The world is plagued by recurrent violence, and this violence shapes the lives and experiences of over 2 billion human beings around the world today. Um, what we often see and talk about in this space is the changing nature of conflict. Uh, we're seeing more non-state armed actors. We're, we're seeing conflict becoming more complex, uh, more prolonged. And we also see um, and know that the era of comprehensive peace agreements is long over. But yet um, the international peace and security architecture and the normative frameworks around them have not changed in the past 50 years. So this is really the impetus behind the Principles for Peace Initiative, uh, which we launched last December, as you said, with the announcement of the International Commission on Inclusive Peace. And the idea behind this initiative is really to facilitate and energize a collective effort and launch a global participatory process to rethink our approach, uh, to develop a new set of international principles and standards. These principles and standards are meant to provide a common frame of reference, uh, provide a common grammar, common language um, that would uh, both inform uh, how peace processes are conceived, structured, and sequenced towards more sustainability and inclusion. So in essence, it is a collective effort to challenge the status quo. Uh, it brings together a coalition of, of partners uh, in the stakeholder platform. Over 27 organizations uh, are part of the core groups, including UN organizations, a lot of our peer organizations in the, in the, in the Peace Caucus, but also many more organizations in the broader, in the broader effort, um, the International Commission of Eminent Figures, who are very diverse, who are very committed to this cause, are currently spearheading a global consultation process uh, on different themes, from pluralism to sustainability to local ownership to uh, uh, security and stabilization. In 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 so many ways, their work will really focus on both bringing global political engagement. Uh, but also to amplify local voices and aspirations and position that at the heart of rethinking um, the international community's approach, but also to build on the empirical evidence uh, as we develop the, the new uh, principles or standards so we can shift both incentives and institutional behavior. And I'm very happy to, to be joined by the co-chair of the International Commission on Inclusive Peace, uh, Mr. Yves Dacot, who is um, joining us as a keynote listener on behalf of the commission, whom I'm sure will take um, all the insights from today's um, discussion into the upcoming commission meeting. So thanks again to our friends and colleagues at Search for Common Grounds for, for this convening and for the close partnership and look forward to this exchange. Thank you very much, Hiba. And that's wonderful to hear how this initiative really wants to bring together the voices of those that are regularly part of these processes, the voices from the field and those that are directly affected, and also the voices of the researchers and the, those that sort of um, keep an eye on everything that is happening and, and draw the, those lessons that we can all learn from. So thank you for that. Um, so um, now uh, we'd love to hear from our uh, field speakers and um, um, you know the first question I guess 
uh, I'm gonna go to Azam first. I'd love to hear a little bit about uh, if you can share with us some of the background of the conflict uh, in your country and who's who has been at the center of the talks and of the, this, the peace process there and who has been left out. And if you can uh, share with us a little bit of sort of background information on, on the conflict. Thank you. Hi. Uh, okay, so the Syrian conflict is a bit difficult to explain given that there are uh, too many actors uh, involved. Uh, so currently, let me just give a brief. Currently in Syria, uh, Syria is divided primarily into three areas of control, uh, partially controlled by the regime uh, through, with Russian and Iranian support, part controlled by the Syrian Democratic Forces, which are Kurdish forces, uh, largely backed by the US. And there's a third part controlled mostly by Turkey. Uh, given this complex landscape with all these uh, powers uh, present, uh, what happens is that generally the Syrian voices tend to be either silenced or uh, basically uh, adapted to represent the powers which support them, which means that the peace processes uh, tend to be uh, either theatrical or non-representative. Uh, this is generally uh, what taints the current peace processes in uh, Syria, uh, which uh, there tends to be several tracks. Uh, first, uh, there's the Constitutional Committee. The Constitutional Committee is the result of uh, years of uh, work by the uh, Special Envoys for Syria. Uh, and they have been laborious to work on, uh, through, in the process of working for a political uh, resolution for the conflict in Syria. And just to, to signify how, uh, how tough things were for uh, the political resolution. Uh, till now, we have had four special envoys for Syria. Uh, and each of them resigned, uh, knowing that, uh, well, basically, his work was not to, to be conclusive, given the absence of will to resolve the conflict on the side of some parties within the uh, Syrian conflict. Uh, and generally, the, uh, the current constitutional committee uh, is divided in three parts. Uh, one part represents the uh, opposition, uh, which is also mostly uh, proxies for uh, other powers. Uh, another part represents the regime, also partially a proxy for other powers and partially uh, representative of its own uh, brutality, basically, and uh, civil society, which is either co-opted by others or uh, they, they are uh, independent representatives of their own opinions. However, the general problem with the committee is that there's a lack of will uh, on the side of the regime mostly to let it advance in any way. Uh, if we talk to people uh, working on the, uh, within the committee, we notice that the regime is not cooperating in any way, and that means that there is no way forward. Uh, especially that, uh, for example, we hear official statements saying that those representing certain parties in the, uh, in the, in the committee uh, do not represent those parties. So the regime said, people uh, in the committee are our friends, but they're not us. So what does that mean for the people on the ground and who's more generalized? Uh, mostly that means that most people are not represented within this peace process because uh, most people are co-opted by, most of the representatives are co-opted by uh, other powers. And therefore there's a huge sense of alienation from the peace processes themselves. Now, of course, there are track two and track three uh, processes which aim at uh, uh, basically delivering the voices of those underrepresented. However, those tend to be viewed as theatrics, awaiting the, uh, the dialogue between the great powers. So basically, everyone's waiting for what will happen with the Iran nuclear deal, what will happen if, uh, if uh, the US and Russia talk. And therefore, there is a sense, and we noticed that in the interviews for the uh, report we produced that uh, people, the, most of the Syrians feel that the world has betrayed them, basically, and no one is standing by their side, and it's basically uh, every man for himself, and that uh, that has been a major concern. Now there are hopes for a better future. Uh, there is always an appeal to faith that uh, we believe that a better time will come. It must come, but uh, do we have any prospects for that better time coming? currently uh, not soon and increasingly the factors pushing for the lack of peace tend to be increasing with the uh, stagnating political uh, landscape the increased uh, securitization uh, of uh, the uh, of the regime and the general mercenarization of syrians so turkey is treating them as mercenaries the russians are recruiting merc mercenaries as well 
uh, and therefore, uh, as well as the de deteriorating economic conditions, which also uh, create an additional uh, push factor towards conflict. Given all this, uh, it seems a bit bleak, but uh, I mean, Syria is a special case for examining where peace processes tend to fail. Uh, and I think uh, this, was, this was an important thing for this report. Thank you. Thank you very much, Azam. And so since you spoke a lot about some of the leadership, some of the elites, some of how, a lot about how the leadership uh, and some mainstream uh, perspectives uh, are coerced into the, the, the general population or the population feels like it, it should align with one perspective or another of some of the leadership. Could you speak a little more about maybe the perspective from the field, from the ground? Uh, from the from from Syrians, what would Syrians like to see in this process? Generally, there are two basic trends which we noticed. One is that we have to revert back to uh, the international institutions, and that, but the international institutions allied with force. So what that means is some military support, for example, for. Uh, creating a certain uh, safe zones, for example, within Syria, where people can actually live uh, in safety. Uh, this was one of the things which were called for. Uh, another thing was that the Syrians need to uh, talk between uh, each other to form a united front, something uh, like a, a, a certain organization which uh, takes in all the Syrians uh, with all their uh, different uh, opposition uh, uh, factions, basically. Uh, from the Kurds to the uh, Turkish-backed opposition uh, all across and for a united front, where then they can have dialogue with uh, a certain uh, leverage. Uh, other people are just hopeless and just want to get out of Syria and uh, find a way just to save themselves, which is a very fair thing to demand given the, what's currently uh, happening. But uh, I do stress that uh, there is a general uh, thinking that there is no way forward as well. Uh, and so within these, uh, people tend to be majorly divided. People would like to be included in the peace process, but they would not like to be included in a theatrical peace process where it's just tokenistic and you just uh, come say what you have to say and then everything's put in a drawer and nothing happens afterwards, which has been happening time and again and again and again, uh, to the point where many people are sick of participating in any focus group or any research or anything like that because they've done that numerous times and nothing came out of all that. So, yeah. Thank you, Azam. So essentially I hear you say that it's either meaningful contribution, uh, but people do not wanna see more of the same. Uh, yeah. and, and if they are to be included, that inclusion needs to be meaningful. It needs to be, um, um, you know, real. They, they really want to contribute to the process. Um, well, thank you. So Tommy, I see you uh, coming back in. We lost Tommy for a second. Um, our colleague from Sierra Leone. Um, so perhaps, uh, Tommy, can you hear me? Okay, so we'll reconnect with Tommy in a second. So maybe I'll go to Zura. Zura, uh, hi again. Um, so the same question is really for you. So uh, for those of us who aren't familiar with the conflict in Afghanistan, it would be great to have a little bit of a background who is leading the process, uh, who has been leading the process and who has been left out and what are the the hopes of the population? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think I'm having a little bit of connection problem which I'm trying to fix up and then I will um, thank you, Tommy. We'll come back to you in a minute. Uh, so, Zura, thank you. Um, good to be here. Um, well, I could have, uh, if, if I had joined uh, this conversation just before you asked your question from Azam, I would have thought that Azam was actually talking about Afghanistan. Um, similar kinds of complexities, uh, uh, international interventions, uh, regional interventions, uh, identity-based divisions and uh, years of protracted warfare that has impacted this, um, the economy in Afghanistan that has created the huge illicit economy that has impacted the culture, uh, the basic landscape of Afghanistan into one which is heavily militarized, which is heavily uh, reliant on 
uh, taking up of arms to uh, resolve um, disagreements. Now, uh, we uh, had a chance to create peace back in uh, back in early 2000s when uh, we had the first Bonn conference, once uh, the Taliban were ousted and um, uh, their opposition, uh, various different opposing factions came together and in Bonn and Germany and uh, decided to create a democratic um, Afghanistan. But one thing we did at that point in time was that we unfortunately favored a kind of a narrative of winners and losers. So we basically built Afghanistan on a fragile, basis of um, an Afghanistan where the winners were non-Taliban and the losers were the Taliban. And based on that, we actually um, created a armed conflict that um, obviously in any armed conflict, you have different sides and different sides are fed through different channels. So this continued to get quite bad. Um, up until about 2014, we were progressing uh, pretty steadily. And since then we've been, uh, we, we have been uh, going down in a lot of the indicators um, around development and human rights and so on, mainly because so much resources and, and effort is being diverted into maintaining a kind of a, a war that has no end. Um, so at the same time, we built a kind of a consensus around peace. So if you had asked me back in early 2000, if I wanted, if I thought, that we could talk to the Taliban and other uh, similar groups to build peace in Afghanistan, I would have probably said no. And so would have a lot of other people um, in the international community in Afghanistan. But steadily um, through the government efforts, non, um, you know, civil society and so on, a consensus for peace was built. Um, and that really reflected a grounds up um, belief system. Them and and moving seen a very strong consensus for peace now peace between whom because we obviously have got the, the Haqqani network other smaller and bigger organizations and the allegiance keep changing so guerrilla warfare um tactics very different to the Afghan National Army, uh, which is being, uh, which was, and to some degree, still is being supported by 40 different, um, very different kind of um, armed forces from around the world. So this continued, and now uh, we have reached a point where the necessity of a peace process is, is become incredibly urgent and clear, especially that there's a tiredness amongst um, people around the world, the, the, the constituencies around the world who are very concerned about um, so much losses, economic losses as they invest in Afghanistan, but also human beings that are being lost um, as they come into Afghanistan to fight a war that people back in their countries don't really necessarily feel is, is something fair. Now, in, uh, in the last year or so, we have seen uh, the more classic version of sort of peace, um, processes. Um, one was the uh, peace deal that was struck uh, last February. Uh, well, not this one. The, um, now, that was, uh, that was an interesting uh, uh, peace process, peace agreement. Um, it was one um, that largely marginalized the role of the Afghan people, uh, the demands of Afghan people, and to a certain degree, the demands and the role of the Afghan state. Um, it uh, basically concentrated on a troop withdrawal of the Americans, uh, the, a guarantee of their security, secure, uh, and a guarantee from the Taliban of the, uh, of, of the uh, non-supporting um, of the uh, terror networks that would work around, um, against Americans. And uh, the one thing that Afghans really look forward to in that um, agreement was the conditionality that um, that would start meaningful um, negotiations with the Afghans, so the start of the intra-Afghan peace talks. And that's something that we really looked forward to. Not a lot of progress has been made, and uh, many Afghans, uh, rural and urban, educated, uh, very conservative and liberal, 
uh, really believe that we lost out and we lost our leverage um, as the, struck, the deal was struck between the Americans and the, uh, the Taliban. The losses that we sustained was um, around conditionality. Uh, the Taliban were let, um, th there was a lot of leverage giving to, given to the Taliban there. Um, uh, thousands of their, um, their uh, uh, prisoners were freed. Um, and the Americans uh, decided on a troop withdrawal, uh, which is happening now. So there was not a lot of pressure that was used to, to create a values-based conditionality um, to the peace talks. At the same time, Afghans are now uh, concentrating on the intra-Afghan peace talks. So the talks between the government and the various different political fa um, factions and the Taliban. Now, that is where the civil society would like to have a greater say. Uh, you ask who is leading the peace process. Unfortunately, the Taliban are leading the peace process in their authentic identity of non-inclusivity um, from women, from uh, youth, uh, from uh, civil society, from ethnic minorities. So there's not a lot of hope for inclusivity on the Taliban um, side, um, even though they, their core constituency are young people, uh, uh, people who fight in their ranks and others. So we, we really hope that there's some degree of at least uh, youth uh, participation there. Um, on the other side, we have the government, obviously. Zura, I'm afraid we, we are losing Zura. Um, Zura? Um, civil society, uh, in, but to what degree or can you hear me now? Hello? Zura, yes, yes. Hello, can you hear me? Uh, now we, we have you back. Just a second, I'm sorry. Um, could I ask you maybe, uh, we'd, love, we'd love to continue seeing you, but it might be too difficult to hear you. So maybe uh, we can keep only the audio. And we lost right before you were about to tell us about the position of the government. Um, so if you could pick up some of that content, I'm, I'm really sorry to ask you to repeat yourself. It's just for the benefit of our discussion. We'd love to uh, not miss anything. Absolutely, no problem. I hope you can hear me now at least. Hello, can you hear yes, me? Yes, yes, thank you. Okay, we brilliant. So with, the, with the government, of course, um, a, a very uh, elaborate structure has been set up. Now, uh, within that structure, you can see a lot of inclusion, um, at least um, to... So you, couldn't, you can say that technically there is some level of inclusion inclusion of young people, of women. Um, there are structures like commissions and committees that are parts of the various different um, peace processes um, structures uh, that, that technically bring the voices of youth, of minorities, of victims of war, of women into the processes. However, how meaningful these inclusions are is questionable. Um, if you look at the... Uh, the negotiating team itself, you can see a lot of the complaints that are usually addressed to the Afghan government. You can see, um, uh, uh, see them applicable to the team as well. Uh, people with um, uh, who have bartered, um, sort of people who have bartered their way into the in, into the processes. People who come from back, political backgrounds, um, political dynasties, um, who are part of these processes rather than. Uh, representing uh, uh, sort of a, a core constituency or a interest group. Um, so those are some of the some of the issues. And, and there's a lot of talking. There's a lot of talking around, let's say, women's inclusion, around safeguarding of, of, the, of the gains of last 20 years in the negotiations. However, how much of this is going to be put on the table? Uh, by a government who are also accused of, of not safeguarding the same, um, same rights and freedoms um, that they're now claiming to advocate for. There's no mechanisms 
that there are not a lot of mechanisms, or at least the government has not created mechanisms that openly and freely connect uh, the track one with the people. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of illusions of um, of, uh, of of inclusion, but the there's a lot of concern about the um, about the about the meaningfulness of it. Now the Taliban are actually actively uh, working towards silencing. We've had immense increase in attacks on people who raise people's voices. So journalists human rights activists, people who advocate for the rights of minorities who were traditionally targeted by the, by, the, by, the, by the Taliban. So these people's voices are being attacked. So, uh, but then I'd echo back what, what Azam said, um, but there is still hope. I'm absolutely, heart, my heart is warmed every day that, uh, that when I see new initiatives coming up, people talking talking uh, with international counterparts, talking with national counterparts and raising their voice through social media. So even though there are lots of restrictions, the voices are physically being silenced. There's a lot of, there's a lot of voices that are being forcefully raised through avenues other than the formal, you know, big hotel where all the negotiating teams are sitting or beyond barbed wires in ministries and so on. Every single day, um, I come across conversations like the ones that we are having right now, but also on, on media, also in universities and so on. And I think that is that should never be um, underestimated, because even though, uh, I mean, history would see that this is the demands, these were the demands of Afghan people, even if they, they were not highlighted at the negotiating table. And there are lots of international partners that are listening to these voices, that more needs to be done to, for these voices to be included. And a lot of courage is required at this point in time, because we cannot um, be lazy and uh, dismiss these voices as the voices of minorities, as the voices of the urban, because as searchers worked in Afghanistan and rural and urban areas amongst various different ethnic groups, the demands are very, very similar. Nobody just wants the end of the war. Everybody wants meaningful peace. And this is something that we could, that our research has shown. And, and, and this is why we need to make sure that we do not, uh, do not engage in, in, in the analysis of Afghanistan from a culturally culturally relative point of view, where we think that Afghans need the end of war, but they do not necessarily want sort of freedom of speech or women's rights to work and so on. So these are the voices that needs to be raised. And we really, th I really think that the international community could, could play a very active role in that. Thank you so much, Zura, for that very comprehensive and very powerful message. Um, and I'm sorry that we've had a little bit of a glitch there, technically speaking. Thank you. So I'd like now to um, go very quickly to Tommy, who's back online with us. Uh, Tommy, can you hear me? Tommy? Okay, maybe there are issues there, but we certainly hope to hear from Tommy. Yes, um, I, yes great, great, I, I, wonderful. I think Tommy. I can hear you. It's okay. just that I am having some connection problem. Yes, yes. So, so uh, perhaps it's best to to uh, keep just uh, uh, the audio and and not not see you, unfortunately, at least for now. So, Tommy, the same question that I asked the others also for that, you. That is, which, that is just what I am doing. Great. There's a little bit of delay. I'm sorry about that. Um, so if you can give us just a bit of background on the conflict in Sierra Leone, who was leading the process, who was part of it, and who, uh, who has been left out, in your opinion? So um, I was not quite clear with the question whether who was leading the peace process or who led the conflict process. What, what, is, what, is, what is the question about? Yes, so Tommy, we'd like to learn a little bit about the, the experience of Sierra Leone. So um, how, who was part of the process and who was left out? If you can give us a little bit also of background context for those of us who might not be 100% uh, familiar with it. Okay, 
So um, the, the, the Sierra Leonean uh, 11 year conflict started, of course, um, in, in 1991, March, it's at the 1st of March, 1991. And um, largely it is, it, the, the conflict broke out as a result of um, um, political divide, political dissatisfaction the, the one party rule was, was there for a very long time. So people were like tired with the, the one party leadership and wanted a change. So, so there was like marginalization and, and lack of inclusivity. One, one set of political party willing the political seats for a very long time. Youth were being marginalized. Women had no voices. Civil society were being muzzled. The, the press was like being muted and, and, and all of a sudden. So, so a, a group of people just thought the only way to do this was to, to go to the bush with, 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 with uh, guns and uh, other armed uh, um, um, forces, took to the bush and started the war. So you history, history has it that uh, the war lasted for 11 years, yes? That, was, that, that is true. But then what happened in Lomi Peace, the Lomi Peace Accord was not um, a peace accord. Largely, the, 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 the notion in Sierra Leone now, the understanding in Sierra Leone, what happened was to end the 11 year civil war. It was not, yes, it is called the Lomi Peace Accord. That was the only title we needed at, at, as at that time. We needed something to put forward to the international community so that we have to stop the war. Sierra Leoneans were tired of the 11 years of brutal, brutality, the 11 years of maiming, looting, and killing. So let me just drop this out as a secret. Even Mal Malawi do not know this. I am a direct victim of, of the war. So I'm, go I'm, just gonna, I'm just gonna give you a, a, a glimpse. I'm, I'm gonna bring my video in. I'm a direct victim of the war. My, my, you, you can see stripes on my, the back of my wrist, my left wrist. This, this, this was just a war court from, from, from an ax. My, this was an attempt to amputate my, 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 my hand. So the, 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 the reality is we wanted to stop the war by all costs, at all costs, by all means. So we had to coin the, the perpetrators then, the, 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 the phobia as leaders, then people that were leading, civil society organizations that were leading, the government of Sierra Leone under the President Kaba regime. And the team was led by the vice president to his, of blessed memory again, Solomon Bayawa. We needed to stop the war, but that was not peace. That was never a peace accord. We needed a name, we needed a title, and it was titled the, the Lumi Peace Accord. So what happened? It was threefold. We had as leaders of that peace accord, which I would call leader of the, they the, 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 the just led the, 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 the motion, they led the team to stop, to put an end to the war. So they led, it was it was threefold, the civil society aspect led by uh, Dr. Judy Ali and uh, all sorts of the big guys in Sierra Leone, professors and, and, and lecturers that formed part of the civil society organization. And then we had the, the religious leaders, the, the, the council of religious leaders in Sierra Leone as well, and then the government of Sierra Leone. They led the team that went to Lomi to broke an understanding, a negotiation to end the war. So, so after this, 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 this engagement with, with Interpeace, after we had interview, after we had interviewed our, 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 our stakeholders, participants, I came to realize that what we had was not a peace accord because from our interaction, from what we interacted, from what we got from our direct inter interviewers, our participants, we came to realize that we just ended the war, but then it doesn't mean we have peace. Because still there is, there is uh, uh, strong marginalization against women in governance. There is, there is iota of violence, um, rift of violence around elections. There is cry around um, the, the poise of the state, the state resources. We have, we are among, we are still among the poorest countries in Syria in, in the world. Sierra Leone is named 
among the poorest countries in the world. And youth, joblessness is, is mounting. People, people we, the, the universities are producing four to 5,000 students graduate every year without jobs. They are coming into society without jobs. These people refer to those things as the, the country is not peaceful. If we still have these things on, the country is still not peaceful. Yes, we, we, have, we, we are good at managing violence. Of course, when, when elections are very close, there are, there are a rift of, uh, of, of petty violences around, around the, 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 the two uh, main political parties. But then because of the presence of um, the greater community, civil society community in the country, we're able to manage those violence and we're able to put them to rest because we don't want to go back to what we experienced. So in, 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 in the Lomi Peace Accord, the, 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 the one key thing that was recommended was to form the, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. This Truth and Reconciliation Commission was formed and there are key recommendations on the TRC, that is Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Now, government in, government out are violating those recommendations that are entrenched in the TRC. And it, 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 it looks like we are going back to where we were that led us to the war. Because when a new government comes in, it, it, the other government, we, we, opposition will interpret their actions as man homes. Whatever the, the, the government does, even if it is good, even if it is for the good of the country, the opposition sees it as, as nothing done. And in Sierra Leone, there is no mistake here. Yeah, make no mistake, there is, there is huge ethno-political divide, ethno-regional divide. The, the country is divided into two. The, 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 the main, the, the ruling party now and the main opposition party. So we have four regions in the country, but then it is divided into the, the south, southeast, and northwest. Northwest forming the opposition party supporters and southeast the ruling party. So there is nothing you will do to convince the, the opposition party to see the good being done by this current government. So there is this bitterness in people. There is this, I am, I am currently out of town. I am, I, am, I am engaging civil society organization for our new project, which is still under um, um, political accountability. That is another aspect. Elected officials are not accountable to the, to the citizens. And, and when you are not accountable to the citizens, you keep them in the dark because they have assumptions, they have doubts. When one day they will come out, and when you come out with their doubts and assumptions, it will not be good. It, 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 it of course, it boils down. It, it, it degenerated to it degenerated to, to conflict and violence. So the, 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 there are issues around recommendations from the TICs, from the, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which every government since since the war since the peace the the war stopped since we we broke understanding to end the war since the war ended. Government, we have had three governments since the war ended. Still, we have not moved 10% to, to, to do the actions of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. So we, 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 and the, the absence of, the absence of barriers, the absence of guns, machets, cutlasses, axes, weapons to fight war does not mean we have peace. Sierra Leone is still struggling to have peace. Yes, we don't have the war again, but then, um, peace yeah. is a big word, it's a big jargon, it's a big terminology that Sierra Leoneans have different interpretation for. Thank you, Tommy. Thank you. Sorry, sorry to um, have to uh, interrupt, uh, but uh, we, we have a very limited time at this point. And I'd love to hear, and thank you so much for also your very powerful uh, tes uh, testimonial from your experience. Uh, Hiba, I would like to uh, hear from you at this point. Um, so after all we've heard, uh, can you tell us a little more about the Principles for Inclusive Peace Initiative? What has uh, inspired this initiative? Why do we need to reframe peace processes? Thank you, Claudia, and thanks to Zohra, Azam, and Tommy for their great uh, interventions. In fact, what inspired the initiative are three things that both um, our three speakers spoke about. The first one is fed upness, the second one is opportunity, and the third one is hope. The sense of fed upness, or what I call usually with my colleagues the khalas, 
moment, which I'm yet to find another word that gives that خلص, you know, the enough moment, the fedness, what Zuhra called the tiredness, what Azam called the loss of hope, and what we also heard uh, from Tommy, um, this, this, this fedness with the status quo, the fact that violence is on the rise, and so is the failure of peace processes, um, really created this impetus that we need to, um, to really rethink um, the approach. This fedness is not only with populations, but it's also with practitioners, actually, with those who are engaged with policymakers who are engaged year after year in seeing, applying the same solution and expecting different results, which Einstein considers to be the definition of insanity, to keep doing the same thing again and again and expect different results. But this is how we could describe, you know, what we see um, from Afghanistan to Iraq to Palestine uh, to different places around the world. And um, uh, Azam and Tommy also had a lot of examples there. And what we see is, uh, is actually on the, on the, uh, on the fed-upness side, what we see are common flaws that are repeated again and again. They're common in various peace processes over the past decades. Um, and these flaws, some of them are associated uh, and are uh, as a result of real politic considerations, which many of our speakers spoke about, and are associated with essentially short-termism, which drives peace processes to be focused more, mostly on negative peace or the immediate cessation of hostilities, short-term milestones, which drive, I think, you, you know, we've, we've seen um, the, this again and again from different countries. And of course, there's an, a moral imperative to silence the guns and to bring in an end to, to the hostilities. But if that is of the account of going deep enough to address the underlying grievances, questions that Zuhra also talked about around the political economy of the conflict, this, is, this becomes really on the account of sustainable peace. And there is not enough balance. And this is something we see again and again. Associated with that also um, are the methodological approach. Peace processes became almost um, identical in the minds of many to a political process. There's a heavy fixation on this issue of negotiations around a table. Um, and this, this, this model has given dominance to uh, elite bargains and power sharing arrangements, which of course are effective in the immediate cessation of hostilities, but in many ways render violence becoming the main currency. Um, and I think Zohra talked about the winners and losers and that kind of formula that, that is uh, created there. And Azam talked a lot about that as well. Um, and I think we've seen it as well in South Sudan in terms of how elite dominated power sharing arrangements that fail to address the root causes of conflict, in many cases incentivize those who were excluded from the negotiations to gain their, their space by being more violent. And another issue um, that we commonly see, which, which all, all speakers, Tommy, Zuhra, and Azam talked about, is how excessively externally driven peace processes tend to be. Um, both failing to engage women and youth, but even failing to engage all relevant elite actors in, in many cases. Uh, we've, we've talked about um, how meaningful inclusion is. Hazam, you've talked about the, the, this, uh, this issue of uh, theatricals. This is a common thing that we, we see um, in many cases in terms of how do we translate participation into influence and move really from tokenism to strategic inclusion. But also essentially, Another common flaw is around the lack of ownership. The fact that 80% um, of Malians today, when in an opinion survey uh, earlier this year indicated that they hardly had any knowledge of a peace process and a peace agreement, that is a big, a big issue. And that links, of course, with the points that Tommy was talking about in terms of the lack of implementation and oversight. So in fact of peace agreements, a third of them go completely unimplemented. So this is why this is the sense of fed upness that I'm talking about with these fundamental flaws that gave impetus to the principles for peace initiative. But then there is the other side, the sense of hope and possibility. And um, Zuhra talked about it. I think I completely agree with her. And maybe this is the, the Palestinian in me as someone who grew up in a crisis country. I think there is something to say about the sense of, of activism and engagement 
um, and the, the need for us to restore hope that peace is possible. And this is really something that the International Commission on Inclusive Peace is very, very keen about it. And there is, there's, an, there's a possibility there. Um, there is a sense of movement. And I think just before COVID-19, we we've seen a historic number of pro-democracy movements in different parts of the world. The sense of activism is not necessarily presented in recent history. And I think there's, an, there's really a possibility and, and a glimmer of hope there. And finally, the opportunity. And I think there are even opportunity and political will within the sustainable, sustaining peace agenda, the, the discussions that are happening at the global level, the fact that also the practitioners have known these problems that we've talked about, but actually are trying to do something about it. This is the beauty, for example, of the traction our initiative has taken, you know, with all the great organizations like Search, International Alert, even UN agencies joining this effort and saying, look, let's rethink, let's take a hard look and see what, what we can do about it. So these were the key, the key drivers behind an initiative like this, which really speak to all the issues that we've heard uh, Tommy, Zuhra and Azam talk about. Wonderful, thank you very much, Hiba. And that echoes also some of what I have found interviewing some of the senior mediators um, for our other research, that there is, is an awareness that something is seriously not working and we need to work together to find alternative ways to do some of this work, to, to manage some of these peace processes. And another point that I want to underline, which when you say, when you talk about the lack of ownership, um, I believe that peace processes are, are a great opportunity for self-determination, for people's self-determination of their future. And if they don't even know that a peace process is taking place, which is incredible, um, then, then where is that opportunity? And where is the opportunity for owning the solutions that they help create? Um, so thank you very much for that. Um, we are uh, five minutes away from the end of this uh, very interesting panel. I wish we had another hour. There's so much to talk about. Um, I perhaps would love to uh, have the opportunity to include uh, a question or two that have come through. Uh, thank you very much for all the listeners for being with us. And so, um, but there's one question that is quite interesting. Somebody says, um, um, in both examples from uh, Syria and Afghanistan, nationals talking to one another before or as part of the peace process sounds necessary. Are we jumping into the peace talks too early without organizing the various national constituents and preparing coalitions? Should we be doing more, essentially, um, uh, to organize internal voices before we jump into a peace process? And I'd love for Azam Zura to speak to that and also Hiba if you want to add something. Uh, so the major problem is that most of the internal voices are actually external voices. <laughs> so when we speak of, for example, uh, in Syria, the Turkish-led coalition versus there's something called the, uh, the Cairo-led coalition versus the Moscow-led uh, opposition. Sorry. And then all these are oppositions, aside from the internal Syrian opposition, which is generally co-opted by the regime. But when we speak of all these, we are not speaking then of the internal uh, actors uh, agreeing on a united front. We are also speaking of the external actors controlling the internal actors agreeing on a united front. So uh, we go back to the external actors. Uh, and generally, there's, there's another question, which goes uh, partially to what Hiba uh, asked, which is, do we want a political resolution or do we want a peace process? If we want a political resolution, then we just let those in power speak, which is basically, uh, in this case, uh, Russia, Iran, uh, Turkey, US, uh, and uh, Saudi Arabia, they can agree and then uh, everyone moves along. And everyone will move along if all these countries agree to that. Uh, so if that's what you want. If you want a peace process, then it's uh, a bit more complex. So you have to speak of uh, uh, transitional justice, for example, uh, and then how do you set up a state, transitional democracy? Uh, how do you reconcile all the communities together? How do you deal with the Kurdish question? And all these things come into play suddenly. And what does citizenship mean? And all these things uh, play a larger role. Now, the role of the elites and all these things is definitely necessary, but also how does the trickle down effect take place is another one question, which is also necessary. I will just add one point, uh, which is the reverse of what uh, Heba said partially, uh, which is 
while we tend to focus on the political process, NGOs tend to focus too much on the uh, peace process because it's generally the easier game to play. Just bring locals together, have a dialogue session, uh, you get the donors' money, and then you say, see, I did reconciliation. And then soon, because of the lack of a political will, a bomb comes and you, <laughs> your whole work shatters basically because then all the conflicts fuel again so there's a certain dialectic between the peace processes and the political processes which has to take place and both have to go hand in hand uh, in my opinion at least and uh, thank you I think this is um, such an important question um, so, uh, in, in, in a very valid one in, uh, in Afghanistan's case. Now, I would, um, um, I mean, Afghanistan, the, in Afghanistan, various different political factions, various different interest groups had 20 years to create coalitions and they did not. What they did instead was they um, tried to continuously barter for a greater share of political power. Now, what comes very, very clearly from the public is that they are almost as dissatisfied in angered and, and they've had enough of the inner squabblings uh, amongst the, the, the what, what they call themselves as, as the Republic. Um, so the, the democratic forces as they are of the non-democratic ones. So uh, we have, um, so we are in a, in a bit of, so looking at the question, we are even in a, in a worse situation where coalitions are not even being built, but where they're built, they're harmful to the peace process because a chair within the, on, on the negotiating table or a share of the resources that are being allocated um, in a, be it prestige, be it economic, is being bartered to form these temporary coalitions and how useful they would be for long term, I, I, I cannot say. If you look at the, op uh, the opposition, the, the other side of the, of the conflict, the Taliban. Now, the Taliban are actually doing it something very different. They are not only not building coalitions, they're actually disintegrating. So now, for last for, for a long while now, um, all the uh, attacks that are trademark Taliban attacks are now being claimed by other um, other uh, other um, military uh, other opposition military groups. Uh, so there they are not joining um, the peace process as coalition, but they are disintegrating to create uh, their ideal power balance so that parts could still use force and create fear and the other parts could then utilize that to uh, to to gain uh, greater traction on the on, on the negotiating table but it's a great uh, it's a great question and uh, i would extend that to the civil society as well we should be uh, asking these questions from ourselves as well how united could we be um, especially let's say uh, how unite how good it would it be to include women's voices and all the other interest groups' voices. So a coalition building, unity outside of these formal um, divisions are uh, is necessary too, in my opinion. And Claudia, just maybe one in one minute, just to add, um, I think uh, one for, for in terms of the roles of the externals, I think one big um, reconciling act that needs to get that the internationals need to get uh, better at is how do we reconcile these real politic considerations that we've been talking about with real society with what people uh, what hopes and aspirations uh, people uh, need this this moral imperative of silencing the guns of stabilizing of putting a lid uh, on on a boiling situation with also people's desire for change for for, for social peace uh, for access and I think that's something that we, we need to really shift the needle on um, significantly. And we look forward to hopefully being able to do that part of this process. Thank you. Thank you, Hiba. Thank you, Zura and Azam, for those answers. Uh, definitely. It's not just a question of um, silencing the guns, of stopping the violence, although that's a very important part of this, or a, it should be a first step. But there's a, so much more to be done in terms of social uh, 
co social cohesion. Uh, that takes time too, but also these peace processes could really do more to bring uh, constituencies together so that they may own both the process and the peace stemming from that process. Um, so thank you, thank you all. I'm sorry again that we were not able to take on more questions. Um, thank you to our great speakers today, Hiba, Zura, Azam, Tommy. Thank you so much for making the time. And um, I, I look forward to more of these conversations as this topic uh, gains more traction and occupies more of our intellectual space and time. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.